afternoon, everyone, and welcome from wherever in the world that you're joining us from. We have a, a very international participants list today, and I'm delighted to see that. Uh, my name is Andrew Cunningham, and I chair the editorial board at the Center for Governance, Risk and Regulation, which is one of the three subject matter centers within the London Institute of Banking and Finance. The other two centers are sustainable finance and digital banking. A few housekeeping remarks before we get started. You can see and hear us, but we can't see or hear you. Um, each of the three panelists will speak for 10 minutes, after which we'll have a discussion and respond to questions. I will be monitoring the chat, um, and the chat is where you should post questions for the panelists, and I will pick out uh, the most prominent questions uh, for discussion. And we will finish at 2 p.m. London time, so in one hour's time. Those of you who would like CPD certificates for attending this event, a link where you can claim the certificate will be contained in the email and the text that we'll be sending out to all participants on this call. That email and text will have a survey asking you what you think about this event, and it will also have that link for the CPD certificates. Now, none of us would claim that financial crime is a new issue for financial institutions. I'm old enough to remember the collapse of BCCI in 1991, an apparently respectable bank doing good work in emerging markets, but which it turned out was riddled with corruption. But I do think it's indisputable that financial crime has become a bigger issue for financial institutions in recent years. It's an interesting point of discussion whether criminals are using banks more now than in the past to launder their ill-gotten gains, whether the volume of dirty money passing through the regulated financial system is greater now than in the past. But we do all know that the consequences of allowing your financial institution to be used by criminals to launder the proceeds of crime are far greater now than in the past. Lawmakers, regulators, and society as a whole take this very seriously. It's also clear that the perimeter of our discussions on financial crime has expanded. There's more to talk about, more to guard against. I remember when in the mid 2000s, the US Treasury first started talking about combating the financing of terrorism, CFT. But we now routinely talk not just about AML, but AML CFT. So today's discussion has three pillars. Firstly, what are the key events that have led standard setters, regulators, and lawmakers to put more pressure on financial institutions to prevent money laundering and the financing of terrorism? Secondly, what are the most important standards, regulations and laws governing how financial institutions must now address their AML CFT risks? And thirdly, what actions should directors and managers take to ensure that they are complying with the new regulatory and legal expectations? We've got three very well qualified speakers to address these issues. The first is Derek Leatherdale, who's the founder and managing director of GRI Strategies, which is a London-based firm that helps companies to strengthen their management of geopolitical risk exposures. Before founding GRI, Derek led the geopolitical risk function at HSBC, and before that he worked in security and intelligence in the UK. Dr. Viri Chauhan is a managing director at Themis, a firm that helps organizations manage all aspects of financial crime risk. And Viri specializes in particular in helping clients respond to enforcement actions related to financial crime. Before working for Themis, he worked for TSB Bank, Deutsche Bank, FDI Consulting, among others. And our third speaker is Katerina Herde-Cook, and she's the Money Laundering Reporting Officer, MLRO, 
and head of financial crime at Bruin Dolphin, which is one of the largest UK fund management firms. She was previously head of compliance and MLRO at Europe Arab Bank and has held various financial crime prevention roles at banks such as Royal Bank of Scotland and ABN AMRO. Now, before I invite Derek to speak, let us ask you, the audience, a question. Let's ask you something first, and let's have our first poll. Let's see what you think about one of the issues we're going to discuss. That will come up any moment. Here we are. So do you think, just answer the first one here, do you think that financial institutions are being unfairly blamed by lawmakers and regulators for facilitating financial crime? Yes or no? Very simple. Do you think financial institutions are being unfairly blamed by lawmakers and regulators for facilitating financial crime? What do you think? So just answer question one, please. Now I can see how this is going. And I can see so far most people are saying no. Come on, the more, I'd like more of you to vote, please. Come on. I know how many people are on this call and I know how many have voted. Do you think financial institutions are being, and it's anonymous, <laughs> just so we're clear, your vote is anonymous. So it's about even, even, no, a few more people have voted. So I'm going to wait another, another five or 10 seconds and I'm going to close it. So about two thirds of the people are saying no, financial institutions are not being unfairly blamed. I'm gonna close the poll now because I want to give time to, I'm gonna end the poll. I can see that 60% of you are saying that they're not being unfairly blamed and about 40% of you think that yes, financial institutions are being unfairly blamed. Derek Leatherdale, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Andrew, and um, great to start with a, um, a sort of controversial question um, to get the sort of uh, to get the juices going um, uh, and, and hopefully uh, a good discussion generated. Um, thanks very much for the intro, Andrew. Um, it's probably worth explaining to people that um, uh, when I set up the geopolitical risk function at HSBC, there's a very clear read across that I suspect many on the call will will understand with particularly sanctions and to some extent uh, terrorism finance too uh, but actually my acquaintance with these issues um, uh, sort of more directly tracks to leading uh, government affairs campaigns and activity for HSBC which included some substantial work on what we called financial system uh, uh, integrity which included money laundering terrorism finance uh, uh, regulation uh, sanctions um, and issues in relation to public-private partnerships. Uh, and I say all of that because um, really that, that sort of provides a kind of an overview of the regulatory and legal context which we will go on to discuss uh, and in which we worked uh, as closely as we could with governments and regulators around the world to try and, if you like, convey messages about how, how we thought uh, money laundering regulation uh, and indeed um, approaches to money laundering could be enhanced and made more effective. Andrew, you kind of already sketched out, I think, in broad terms, the, um, as it were, the, uh, the picture of how we got to where we are and that financial institutions are under more legal, uh, more regulatory and indeed wider sort of stakeholder and social pressure um, on financial crime issues in general. But I think I'd probably highlight five or six uh, elements in that kind of journey um, uh, just to sort of set the context for the discussion uh, and I'll rattle through those uh, sort of as quickly as I can. I think this all really starts with the creation of FATF, uh, the Financial Action Task Force in the late 1980s um, and that was set up under the auspices or, or sponsored if you like by the G7 and clearly in the years since its membership has grown uh, and, and the way it works has, has become more formal including through the use of uh, the mutual evaluation process. Um, uh, and, and that I think is, is the, uh, from the international standards perspective, is the sort of key origin and start point for, for the kind of pressure that 
uh, financial institutions uh, now face on this agenda. Um, just sort of moving the story on, I mean, clearly FATF, um, you know, through the 1990s was becoming progressively more formal. But I think the next key event to bear in mind, and Andrew, you sort of obliquely referenced this, uh, was 9-11. And suddenly the realisation amongst uh, uh, governments um, and, and lawmakers globally that the financial system uh, was potentially facilitating uh, terrorist activity on a, on a global basis or potentially a global basis. Um, uh, and so, you know, in the aftermath of 9-11, a huge amount of effort was put into uh, sort of, if you like, incorporating uh, measures um, uh, to uh, inhibit and obstruct terrorism financial flows uh, into um, the sort of broader financial crime uh, architecture. And, and Andrew, to your point, I think that's why, you know, as you remember, you know, the US Treasury um, uh, in the mid uh, 2000s, you know, saying, right, we now need to include terrorism finance. And in fact, it was more or less in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 um, that A, the US uh, government uh, introduced the Patriot Act, uh, which included some important financial crime provisions, uh, but also that B, there was near universal agreement that FATF's mandate would expand to include terrorism finance as well as money laundering. Um, in a European context, in the years since then, there have been a succession of new money laundering directives. I think we're on uh, MLD6 now, if memory serves, but um, you know that is a process that's been running uh, for uh, several years, many years now, and that, that is also a key element of the story. And then I would just, I think, point um, uh, by way of sort of um, uh, rounding out the kind of the broad context to two other things. One is, well, maybe three other things. First, I think in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, uh, the emphasis on risk management um, uh, in general terms in financial institutions clearly very substantially increased. And I think in that context, approaches to financial crime and regulatory expectations uh, on financial uh, uh, crime compliance within financial institutions also increased, even though that wasn't, as it were, the origin or the source of the global financial crisis. Um, in the course of that, and as a consequence of the global financial crisis, um, the uh, G20 set up the Financial Stability Board, and that has become, as it were, a vector of uh, international standards too, uh, in respect of, um, or at least coordinating uh, international uh, regulatory activity on matters that pertain to financial crime, particularly around correspondent banking and cross-border payments. So that's another sort of piece of the international standards architecture. Um, the Basel Committee have also produced guidance um, for uh, national authorities uh, and financial institutions uh, in, uh, or, or in the, um, or on the way that uh, they should approach financial crime compliance activity. And then the final two things I would highlight sort of, um, which really bring the story up to date. Uh, 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 first, the, the use, the, the very substantial and significant use of deferred prosecution agreements in response to uh, financial crime failings. Uh, I worked in HSBC when uh, we, we were the first GCIP uh, to be on the receiving end of a US-UK DPA and a five-year monitorship accompanied by a, uh, a fairly hefty nearly $2 billion fine. Most of that was in response to money laundering failings, but they were also contained within the, within the um, uh, rationale for the DPA. There were concerns around uh, a sanctionable activity that HSBC had facilitated, and there were also concerns um, uh, around uh, HSBC, the possible use of HSBC affiliate um, uh, banks um, uh, in facilitating uh, terrorism finance. Um, and HSBC was sort of the first, but then a number of other GCIBs um, uh, found themselves in similar positions uh, and, and faced even larger fines as well as DPAs and uh, monitorships. And I think that really sort of embedded then a much more intrusive style of regulatory oversight on financial crime. And then the final point, and, and this I think um, is, is really very salient given uh, uh, events in Eastern Europe this year, but, but, but also in other uh, aspects of, of the global geopolitical environment, there has been an increasing use of sanctions. 
and that has been accompanied by increasing complexity in the sanctions regimes that principally the US but also the EU uh, and others uh, have introduced uh, against uh, governments that um, uh, they have uh, fallen out with for want of a better piece of shorthand, you know, most recently clearly in respect of, of Russia. Um, but that increasing use of sanctions as it were as a kind of uh, almost a geopolitical or national security policy tool I think effectively means that financial institutions are kind of the first line of defense uh, on behalf of a number of national governments uh, in a way that uh, perhaps wasn't the case sort of 30 or, or more years ago. So I think that, that that's just sort of a very broad overview um, of, of sort of how we've got to where we are and, and why uh, uh, and what's been going on um, that, that sort of brings us to the point where financial institutions are facing more pressure on this. Um, you, know, you, you could probably wrap in a, a, a piece in this conversation about the role of uh, NGOs um, and, and other civil society groups uh, uh, and sort of articulating, if you like, wider social expectations uh, on, on the way banks operate. And there's probably a piece in there too around the introduction of uh, bribery and corruption uh, legislation. And of course the FCPA and the US has been there for a long time. Uh, but other governments have, have brought in uh, 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 anti-corruption uh, and anti-bribery legislation too. Um, but that, that's broadly, I think that's probably enough to be getting on with, Andrew. I don't know if you would, um, it, that I think uses my allotted time. Thanks very much, Derek. And I'm, I'm, the, the phrase that you use of financial institutions being, on the, being the first line of defence, or uh, becoming the first line of defence, is something that I'm sure that we will pick up later in this uh, in this discussion. Um, bef before I go to Dr. Viri, um, we're going to have another poll, and hopefully this poll will work a bit better than the last one did. So I apologise for the uh, glitches in the first poll, uh, but if we could launch the second poll, please. All right, I can... Uh, okay, that looks like the first one. But the second question, which is, which bodies do you think are best able to set rules for how financial institutions should fight financial crime. And I want one answer, uh, Bank for International Settlements, FATF, uh, the na national regulatory authorities and parliaments, industry bodies such as local banking associations or something else that's not mentioned there. So uh, you could only have one choice, but who do you think, which bodies do you think are best able to set rules for how financial institutions um, should fight financial crime. And I can see how people are voting. And someone's telling me that it's not possible to submit answers again. And I can see people are voting in the chat that fat. So people are voting in the same in the chat, they just can't submit for one, only one question. Uh, but several people are voting for FATF. And I can see someone's national regulations, FATF again. I'll let this run for another 10 seconds or so. Another FATF, more FATFs. Okay. I'm going to let it run for just a little bit longer. I mean, no Andrew, one's saying I... national regulatory authorities. No one's saying industry bodies. Andrew, just whilst we're waiting, may I chip in a quick comment on, on this um, yes. very briefly? Please. Uh, just to say that um, the, the slight nuance with FATF is, of course, that its recommendations are largely aimed at national authorities. Um, so the impact on uh, regulated financial entities is, as it were, indirect. Um, mm. But but clearly, there's quite a close reflection um, uh, of what FATF say that national authorities should be doing in respect of a whole range of things and the way they then regulate financial institutions. Mm. OK, I'm going to close that down. Dr. Viri Chauhan, the floor is yours. I understand you have a couple of slides to share with us. So if you could share your screen, please. Of course. And we'll listen to what your point of view is. Yeah. Fine, can you all see that? Great, okay. 
So thank you for having me and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so my name is Viri Chauhan. Uh, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I have recently completed a PhD in illicit financial flows and looking at how uh, dirty money is moved across borders and looking in detail at the money laundering aspects, uh, bribery, and bribery and corruption, and also other non-related aspects like transfer price abuse. So I bring that all into this discussion today, but today we're going to be talking about the regulatory landscape. Uh, so music to some people's ears, but bedtime reading for others. But I'll start off. So as Derek actually mentioned, you know, the, the starting point um, is actually FATF. And what I'm going to do in this short presentation is just give you a couple of updates uh, globally um, from FATF, from the EU, uh, and also then focus on a model which I've developed that can apply to any jurisdiction, actually. And I've chosen the UK because um, there's sort of quite prominent legislation and regulation that's come in and might be interesting for you. So with the Financial Action Task Force, they are recommendations. They're not actually law. They're described as soft law. Uh, the most recent update was a revision of the recommendation 20. Uh, four, and this was really looking at sort of uh, beneficial ownership of legal persons with some new definitions to strengthen the standards uh, on that area. And again, these updates happen periodically. And it's almost, I think, you know, the fact that previous poll, which was suggesting, you know, which is the, the main AML rules and regulations you should follow. Well, in my opinion, you know, the FATF is almost like a Bible. It's, it's a guidance for member countries to adopt, but they generally then get distilled into local regulation as well. And those of you who do know, you know, the, the money laundering directors from the European Union uh, have been adopted from the FATF regulations. And I've got a really nice model for you. So if you look at what's happening uh, currently in the EU at the moment, some key sort of uh, changes happening. There is a new EU AML authority uh, in progress at the moment, and that will transform uh, money laundering and uh, financing of terrorism supervision. It will be the central authority coordinating national authorities. Um, there's gonna be new regulations on AML CFT, and this will contain directly applicable rules. So you know the differences between regulations and directives. Directives you have to adopt usually within a two year period. Regulations, when they come in, they are standard across the European Union. Now, even though the UK is out of the European Union, the UK will be looking closely at this uh, uh, European legislation. And that new regulation uh, will look at areas of customer due diligence and beneficial ownership. So we also mentioned, you know, the fourth, fifth and sixth money laundering directives. So let's just have a look at the most recent one, which is the sixth directive. Um, so the key aspects here are that uh, the sixth six money laundering directive sets out a harmonized list of 22 money laundering predicates offenses, including two new offenses of cybercrime and environmental crime. Now, predicate offense is basically the offense that leads on to a qualifying money laundering offense. The key here is, particularly for the U UK and the United Arab Emirates and other countries, in those jurisdictions is all crime jurisdiction. So what that means is that whilst the European Union have set out these 22 predicate offences, which are usually the more serious offences like bribery and corruption uh, and other stuff like that, if there's an offence in the UK, any offence that leads to a proceed of crime being transferred into the financial institution, that will class as a money laundering offence. So actually it's a, quite a good thing for all crimes jurisdictions to have that um, sort of level of, I suppose, uh, enforceability. Uh, but you know, like the US, they set out their predicate offences as well. So UK and uh, United Arab Emirates and other jurisdictions are all crimes jurisdictions. So any proceed will class as a money laundering offence. Uh, other aspects on the sixth uh, MLD, uh, there's a, a new 
aiding and abetting to the definition of money laundering, cr criminal offense. Uh, they extended the criminal liability for money laundering to legal persons, uh, especially enabling organizations to be punished for criminal activity perpetrated by employees. Now you may say, you may have seen in the UK, there's a special doctrine called the identification doctrine. That's going through the sort of the, the lawmakers at the moment to try to put that more onus on company ownership on that. So you may have seen that recently. Uh, there's introduction of harsher punishments for money laundering offenses, but you know, certain jurisdictions already have those in place. In the UK it's 18 years, as you probably know. And also there's requirements to, uh, for member states to share information in order to facilitate dual criminality prosecutions that span inter international borders. That's a quick sort of run through the, the money laundering uh, directive. Um, and then what I want to show you now is how does this all fit into place in, in say a, a, a country or, a, or your firm's particular approach to it? Now, this is something I developed a while ago, which I've been continuing to develop because I find it really useful to set it out. So, you know, at the at the bottom, what we've got is the Financial Action Force uh, recommendations, and these will get updated. But the principal ones are from 2012. But as you saw, you saw a March update of 2022, which I showed you earlier. So those set out the global standards. Now they're not hard law, but countries will adopt them. And as a result, jurisdictions and people like the European Union will adopt them in their money laundering directives. Uh, then that gets adopted at local legislation. So for example, in, the, in Europe, those countries affiliated to the European Union, they would have to have their local laws affiliated to the EU directives and potentially to Africa to FATA. So in the local legislation, for example, I'll just give you a few examples of what's going on in the UK. Um, we've got a number of new laws which have come in recently, Economic Crime Transparency and Enforcement Act. Uh, so this was to really increase transparency of who owns property in Britain, usually to address the, the flow of illicit financial flows coming in from countries like uh, Russia. Second was strengthening authorities' powers to confiscate unlawful, uh, un unlawfully obtained wealth. The third was to make it easier to promote uh, prosecutions for people breaching sanctions. Uh, and the fourth was to make amendments to the sanctions and anti-money laundering act of 2018 to make it easier for government to impose sanctions. So you will recognize that following the, the invasion of Ukraine, the UK used this a legal instrument to start sanctioning those uh, new persons of interest. Uh, and this was not originally part of the bill, but it was added as an amendment. Um, and then you've got uh, other uh, legislation, the, the updated money laundering regulations. Um, and the main aspect of that, which you should be fam not familiar with, but you should take note, is that proliferation financing now there's a requirement for firms to do a risk assessment. So normally firms regulated would have had to do a AML and CFT risk assessment by uh, law. Uh, they would have had to show that and to the regulator if that was applicable. <laughs> Proliferation financing now has been added to that list as a result of this new uh, money laundering regulation amendment. And you can see how that goes in into sort of then you go higher from local regulation, you've got the FCA handbook uh, and the CISC uh, controls, uh, maybe familiar with the senior managers and certification regime, you know, that was a result of the financial crisis to make um, managers more accountable and change of culture. And then as you go up, you get more granular into what's expectations from firms. Now, as I said, this is UK focused, but you know, different jurisdictions will follow a similar model, actually. Yeah. So you've got the FCA handbook, you've got thematic reviews and reports, and you've got something which, you know, even if you're not in the UK, I recommend you look at, is a joint money laundering string, steering group guidance. And it really sets out tactical operational aspects on how to, you know, uh, implement money laundering controls. And then you've got your own fir uh, policy, your own firm's policies and procedures, which sit on top of all that, which will bring that all together. So I hope that's a useful model for you to use. 
we will be sharing the slides so you can have them. And I will stop there. I will just stop sharing so we can take any questions if need be. Thank you, Viri. And I think we could we can all see, as, as you have said, that that model, although it's uh, expressed explicitly for showing UK, one can see that when we have people on this call from Malaysia, from Indonesia, from Bangladesh, from Turkey, that um, you can build that up in your Absolutely. own jurisdiction, perhaps putting in a regional FATF organization yeah. at some point in there to, to build that up to all the pressures that are building on, on a firm. Um, do put comments or questions in the chat. John Smith, thank you. I'll be coming to that question later on. Ka Katerina, um, if I may just pick up by way of introduction, going back to Derek's comment, financial institutions for the first are the first line of defense. Well, you're the MLRO, so you're the first line of defense of the first line of defense. You're first line of defense squared. So tell us what it's like um, and what actions we should be taking. Thank you. Um, I, I would actually say I'm second line on defence of the first line on defence, but I'll get to that actually because I have this in my in my talk. Um, the poll didn't work, but I did have a sneak peek when we did it the first time round, and it wasn't a surprise to me that it was the third answer that I kind of won it. I'm just going to read it out because I did actually put it on my papers. So, do you think financial institutions are winning the war against financial crime criminals? And the answers were either yes, we're gradually winning the war was a longer answer, but I'll keep at that, or no, we're losing the war, or it's an everlasting war, we may never win, but we can make it more difficult for financial criminals to use our institutions to make their illeg illegitimate proceeds look clean. And I, I would put myself in the third one too, I mean, as an MLRO, you kind of hope I would go, yes, we're gradually winning the war, it doesn't always feel that way. But I do think you have to think of it a bit like a game of whack-a-mole, where something new always pops up, either a new form of crime or a new regulation, and you always have to protect yourself against that. But every time you do that, it's like the, the net is closing in somewhat, right? And then we can face the next challenge. If we didn't do that, then it would probably just be anarchy, um, and we would all be used for money laundering. And I think that's the, the stance we all take, is that if we didn't do anything, we would be used for money laundering. Uh, so remember, this is why we do this. Um, we are all on the same page, on the same team. We are on the same team as the regulators and law enforcement. And I want to say that because it doesn't always feel that way, uh, especially if you have a regulatory review being conducted on your firm uh, and then look at all the regulatory fines. Uh, but we are actually trying to fight the same course. And I think we should bear that in mind, especially if we have a visit from the regulator. Uh, so I'm going to build on these two elements now that Derek and Viri have been talking about. It's both that um, the threat of crime and why all this regulation is coming to play. And it's also how you protect yourself to ensure that your institution is following all this regulation. And I really loved that slide. Thank you, Viri, with all the, the, the regulation in the UK now, because it's gotten a little bit uh, difficult to keep on top of, actually. Uh, there used to be the money laundering regs. That's what we talked about. And now there are acts and there are exit acts. And, and, and it was, you know, there are so many pieces coming out it can be quite burdensome. And I look at this, um, so like I said, I, I'm responsible for the financial crime framework in, at Bryn Dolphin. The way I divide things out is that I look at the regulatory compliance as one element uh, that we need to ensure we have in place and protect ourselves against any fines. And then we have the actual facilitation of financial crime risk, which is that, are we being used to facilitate financial crime? And you think, if you implement the regulatory side, you automatically protect yourself, but it's not actually that easy. And as you can see on a lot of the fines that are coming out, a lot of them are about your framework uh, and not being great. And when you do also have a crime happening, then you know the fines are humongous. Um, so it is a twofold. They both have to, to coexist. Um, and because of the, the very international audience, I'll try to keep it quite broad and highly level in the sense of not too UK specific, but there will be a few elements. Um, so I'm going to talk about the priorities for a successful AML risk management framework. Um, and this is nothing new, like you said, Andrew, at the start, it really isn't. Um, but I think what we need to do is, is manage it better. So hopefully I can give a few tips on that. Um, when I've gone through that, I want to quickly talk about when it goes wrong, uh, who's in trouble, and what needs to what tends to be the problem, what tends to go wrong. 
So first of all, let's think about it in these lines of defense. Uh, a financial institution should set up these lines of defense, and it's for good reason, because you will have your second line, uh, where I sit in my firm, who will interpret that regulation, turn it into policy, set all the standards, test the, the standards, make sure we're compliant, issue the training. Then you will have those that actually do the doing, the first line of defense, the client facing side, and they will be the ones setting up the appropriate controls to mitigate these risks in conjunction with us, of course, but I can't understand all parts of the business. They own their controls, they manage them, they We've lost you, Catherine. Improve them when they fail. And then you have your third, sorry? Um, we good. just lost lost you for a second, but you're back. Okay, good. Uh, so the first thing, the most important thing is to set your risk appetite. If you haven't got a risk appetite, you don't actually know what it is you're trying to build. And I think here it's really important to understand that you can have a low risk appetite. You don't have to have a low risk appetite. And if you are an international bank, for example, operating in a high risk um, part of the world or several, uh, you offer products like correspondent banking, uh, like trade finance, you can't be a low risk institution. So then you accept that there are some risks out there that you simply have to, to be able to deal with if they happen and materialize. If, as in my example, we're a UK based wealth manager uh, with no third party payments and predominantly local clients, we say we have a low risk appetite. And that means we can't then go on uh, and, and onboard a really high risk, uh, politically exposed person um, who's uh, all over the media for corruption, because it's not within our control to mitigate that risk. And then you cannot take that on. So it's a very sort of important part. Who's responsible for that? It's actually the board. The board sets the appetite. Of course, they may need some support from your subject matter experts in the field. But it's ultimately them deciding where they want to place their appetite, because then they will make the decisions about the controls and the systems and the resource that you're going to put into that to maintain. But everyone has to understand and live it. This is really the whole tone from the top thing. Um, and I think we'll be touching on John, John's comment in the comment fields, um, because this is all about you, you have to actually show your staff that you're living up to this risk appetite. Um, and then you can also, so we have divided our risk appetite into that regulatory compliance appetite and the actual facilitation of financial crime. So we would argue we have a very low risk appetite for regulatory breach, but we have a low risk appetite for facilitation. It might seem petty, but it is quite an important distinction. When you have that, you need to build up uh, your regulatory obligations. And this is quite tedious work, but actually with all those regulations out there, how do you know what applies to you? How do you know what, what you need to mitigate against? So that is the mapping of regulation into your own business, what you do. Uh, we call that our regulatory obligations register. It's huge. Um, it's in an Excel, but it is, you know, it's all the rules, all the requirements out there. And then we say what we do to meet that requirement. Where in the policy do we have it? Where in procedures do we have it? It's tedious work, but it's really worthwhile. Um, and as senior managers, that's how you get that oversight um, of where your controls are. You, of course, you have to also translate it well into policy so that it's something that works for your organization. Uh, and this type of thing, together with training, of course, on, on what's required, tends to sit in that second line of defense. This is my area. This is what we do. We're responsible for then you feed it into the first line of defense who will build the controls. And they have to set up their processes and procedures to mitigate against all these elements and ensure that we have uh, the right level of controls. Um, that is done together with the first line. You can't build that in second line of defense. So that's sort of your regulatory compliance side of things. Then you have to really understand the risks of money laundering. You do that through your risk assessment and risk assessment just cannot stress enough is probably the most important thing you do because it's the enterprise wide risk assessment and that is where you don't look so much at the regulation you look at the risks so what type of institution have you got correspondent banking what risks come with that if we don't have it we don't have it then we don't look at those risks we look at other risks we look at source of wealth we don't set up current accounts we don't have to worry about that you know the the uh, lots of transactions in and out. We don't allow third party payments, but we do worry about taking on 5 million from someone we didn't know yesterday. So that's where our efforts go in. 
Um, and when you have that, you can then assess the controls that you set up. And it can be the same controls as you have in the other one. This is where it gets a bit complicated um, with your regulatory elements. So we tend to combine them into where we say that's the you know financial crime control, and we will look at where in the in the institution that sits. And again, you can't do this risk assessment in second line of defense. You have to involve your first line, the control owners. So they understand what it is they're mitigating. And if those controls aren't good enough, it's the first line's responsibility, it's the client facing side or the operational side who need to be able to fix them. Um, and we're always there as the, the second line subject matter expert. So use your second line if you are in the first line, if you're you know, here as senior managers. If you are here as the second line of defense like me, really make sure you reach out to that first line because you cannot mitigate this risk on your own. And then you need to be able to report on this. You need to be able to escalate any, any failures, right? You need to be able to build up something that will tell senior management and board where it's working and where it's not. So the way I've done that is you take your risk assessment where you assess all your controls. You will then take that and I picked up my key controls. We we're talking hundreds here. I picked up my key controls and I turned them into a monthly dashboard where we test those key controls on a monthly basis through our compliance monitoring program. We go sample check onboarding, we go sample check our transaction monitoring alert handling, and that will give a picture. <laughs> all the way through the year upwards, it goes all the way to board and we will agree what we need to do. Do we need more resources? Do we need a new system? What is it that needs to be done? So that would be my recommendation on risk assessments. Do not do them once a year and just forget about them because you'll see when I get to when it goes wrong, um, what goes wrong, it's the risk assessment. Um, so that was really what I wanted to talk about in terms of the framework. And I'm trying to really be very quick here because we only have 10 minutes. So when it all fails, then what happens when it all fails, it tends to be, and this is us reading, you know, fines and, and the like of, of the last many, many years. It's the risk assessment. Almost every single regulatory fine says your risk assessment wasn't good enough. So it's not enough to just have one. You have to be able to explain how you got to the conclusion of it. Uh, very often, it's not having set that clear risk appetite as well. It's particular controls failing, transaction monitoring always it tends to be really is really difficult to tune a transaction monitoring system and look at the rb or rbs um, prosecution it, i mean the, the monitoring where alerts turned off because they caused too many alerts and it, it's just or sorry uh, the, the actual alert thresholds uh, turned off because of the number of alerts and things like that it's very very dangerous to not do that in a very very uh, sensible manner uh, and the other thing is not having documented things, not having said why you're not doing something, not having documented why you're late with your periodic reviews or why you're not you know, happy with something or why you are happy with something. I get chills when I see someone say approved to something. It has to be approved based on or because of or this is my rationale for approval. Um, who gets in trouble? I thought I'll quickly use that RBS example, actually. Uh, it started off really well. Um, new client was onboarded because we all know this one was the gold dealer, right, in, in the Midlands. So RBS onboarded this gold dealer in Bradford, made it high risk, appropriately so. Uh, and they said, no cash service, so great, um, you know, on we go. But later, no, no periodic reviews were done. They were downgraded to low risk. And the monitoring alerts never happened because they turned the right... Um, uh, thresholds off for, for that type of monitoring because they couldn't handle the output. And it's a bit simplistic here what I'm saying, it was a very long report, but, but essentially what you're seeing is all these little steps going wrong. Uh, and you could say, for example, um, in terms of the, the change in risk of the client, they would look at your the client facing staff here, why did they change the risk of the client? It could be a personal uh, issue. Uh, someone doing the wrong thing. It can be uh, perhaps they were doing a, a big uh, risk mitigation project that went wrong and someone there has to be held responsible. 
um, they could look at the money laundering reporting officer like me. Uh, why wasn't I testing? How did I not know that this was happening? Uh, same with the periodic reviews. No periodic reviews. I should know that. Why didn't I know that? Uh, bags of musty smelling cash that were accepted uh, by first line. How can that even be um, when we all know what money laundering is? Training comes to mind. Did I train my staff properly as MLRO? Did the staff who got the training actually uh, implement any of that? Very, very personal liability here in accepting cash. Um, and then, of course, the, the overall kind of just everything going wrong. That's the institutional responsibility, right? So here they didn't actually go after a person. I, I just think they couldn't because there were so many things going wrong, uh, so many parties involved. And I looked at it and I was, you know, again, and you kind of, as MLRO, you get really frightened when you see this because you, you think straight away, I'm sure you're all thinking, where was the MLRO? Uh, we have to then look at what, what steps did the MLRO take in all this? Because if I had spotted the issues, raised the issues, told my board the controls were failing, if I'd done all that and I didn't get the resource I asked for and I didn't get the support I needed, it's, it's actually... All the way up to the board. Uh, so it's very difficult to pin down who's in trouble when you see these things um, and easy to start pointing fingers without having the full picture. Um, that's why we need to build a really strong framework and you need to document it really well. So for those senior managers on, on this call, I think that is my, my key message in this is you really have to understand this framework it's not good enough if you sit on the board or in, in Exco to just see it every once. Once in a while and go, yeah, great, the MLRO has done it and maintain it, make sure it's effective. If you don't know if it's effective, you need to ask the questions. Why is it not that I know? How, how can I know it's effective? Uh, show me that in the next report and then document all decisions. That was my... Great, thank you very much. It's a lot to a lot to mull over there. Before I pick up the point about um, AI, and I'm going to introduce the word regtech, but before I go there, I would like to pick up a point made by Muhammad Shahid Al Islam, um, where, if I'm understanding his point correctly, we've been talking about tone from the top and governance coming down. What about things going the other way? So, if you're in the second line and you're reasonably senior but you need to impose and get buy-in from very senior people. And we know that in many countries, not just emerging markets, some of them are politically connected. Now, how can you get things going up the other way um, to ensure that you're getting buy-in from the top? How are you getting sort of tone from the, from, the, from the second line going all the way up? And anyone can come in here, but let's start with Katerina. I think that can be so challenging in a bigger, in a much bigger firm than I am in now. I've, I've talked to my board. I have, you know, monthly meetings with the NEDS. So I've got very direct contact and very easy way of escalating. But it, when you are in a really large firm, that can be very challenging. I think you have to be quite uh, strong and quite loud when you see something isn't right. And you probably don't just need to say it once. You probably need to repeat it again and again, probably with a red rag to show them on paper. Would anyone else like to come in? Very would or Derek, would you like to come in here? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll mention something. I think um with certain jurisdictions, the, the regulator has put this on the on the executive board. So and other jurisdictions will probably follow. So um I'll give you a summary of what the financial conduct authority are asking of senior managers. They're asking that senior managers are accountable for financial crime. Uh, senior managers are involved in decisions and discussions about financial crime. And senior managers are able to explain financial crime risks in their organization to somebody else. Those three things sound quite uh, straightforward, but if you think about them, what that means is that that senior manager has to be really involved in all the key decisions which are being made with high risk financial crime situations. The, they haven't got a choice anymore in the UK not to be involved. Um, so other regulators will follow. 
Derek, is there anything you'd like to add before we move on? No, I don't think so. I think sort of between Katerina and Revere, they, they pretty much covered what I would have said. Well, let, let's address the point about AI that John Smith made. And I'm, I'm going to throw in uh, also RegTech there. To what extent of the challenges that we've been addressing here, are that, to what extent are they solvable by AI and RegTech? Can we put our faith in that? Who would like to start on that? May I just offer a, a kind of slightly oblique answer, Andrew, that, uh, and I'm somewhat out of date now on regulatory posture on the use of reg tech, but I well remember uh, leading efforts to persuade national regulators to allow the use of sandboxes for uh, the deployment of experimental AI and other forms of reg tech. And actually, sometimes it was the regulatory posture itself, which was an obstacle. So to give you, for, in, for instance, uh, th there was a situation in which uh, we were proposing, along with a number of other banks, to pool uh, discrete customer data sets and then use uh, artificial intelligence uh, technology to try and identify illicit financial flows that had run across multiple financial institutions. The regulator said, great idea. Uh, we then said, but if we do this and uncover evidence of, uh, of, of illicit financial activity, can we have your guarantee that you won't then launch an enforcement action against us? Because after all, this is an experimental use of AI and regulators didn't give it. And you know that, that I think is a really interesting example of where um, actually, it's quite difficult sometimes to embrace these sorts of new technologies. The other one uh, that, that uh, was often talked about were the development of KYC utilities, the idea that uh, individual customers and clients uh, would sort of get their KYC accreditation through a third party, uh, a bit like credit um, uh, ratings agencies for, for individual loans. Um, uh, and, and there was a problem with the with the regulation on this that um, essentially meant that KYC utilities couldn't be deployed in that way, even though they would um, uh, potentially save a lot of effort, a lot of duplication across financial institutions, because in the regulation, um, uh, not just in the UK, but actually in most national rule books, uh, it very clearly stipulates that individual financial institutions cannot rely on third party information for uh, their KYC processes. So there would be no regulatory defense if the third party in question made a mistake uh, in getting the, the, the customer or client KYC uh, CDD documentation. So that's just kind of two examples of where I think there are barriers that are sort of almost outside of financial institutions control uh, to, to developing and deploying some of these um, uh, ideas. Mm. Very or Katerina, would you like to come in? Yeah, I'll come in quickly. There's a there's a project going on in the EU called Trace, um, and it's developing AI solutions to disrupt illicit money flows. Uh, if you just search Trace AI on Google, you'll find it. And it's actually a project which is led by one of my former colleagues and my PhD supervisor, Professor Umat Turkson. It's really targeted at law enforcement agencies, but you can see where the direction is going, is, is really trying to identify so the illicit flows within the traditional channels where money is going, which is obviously commingled, but identify which of it is, is dirty. I think it's a very interesting project. And I think in answer to your question, Andrew, I think it's going to be complementary. It's all, like all of these things, you know, it's not going to be the, the silver bullet, but it's going to be one of the uh, items that will help in identifying illicit money. Catherine, do you want to come in here or should we move on to something else? Yeah, most of it has probably been said. I do think that technology and, and AI and everything is going to be the only way to really be able to detect because everything moves so fast. Um, it, it's one of those things that, you, of course, they don't just operate on their own. You need you know, interpretation and, and the right thresholds and all that kind of thing but that is probably in terms of monitoring and, and transactions that will be the, the most important part mm. of the mitigation. Katerina you said at one point that we we're, we're on the same team as the regulators um, and yet uh, Derek seems to have given a couple of examples where, where it 
doesn't seem you are, or it didn't seem that you that Derek was. How how can we resolve this? I mean, how can how can you try to ensure that the regulator understands that you're on the same t- on the same side? And, and if things are not qu- quite right, if that if that relationship seems to be dysfunctional, what what would you do about it? It was probably just me, Andrew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, I think I think you have to think of yourselves as part of the same team because you don't want that fight. I get it. it's really hard. I mean, because it's the same with an internal audit. Of course, when an internal audit come come in and, and test all your processes and you get these findings against you, you know, it is hard not to take it personally and, and get quite agitated about it because you know you really tried very hard. But I think that's the key. So there's communication here. You do have to talk to your regulator, you have to understand, and as you can see, when you cooperate, when you perhaps admit your mistakes and things, at least the fines are lower. And I don't think anyone, you know, it, with these big fines for RBS, for, for the, the Scandinavian banks, for you know, almost any bank actually, that they would say it was totally unfair to fine them. Um, but you have to kind of overcome that feeling. Um, but you also should be able to, I think, perhaps to a, great, to a greater extent than we do today, be able to challenge uh, regulation and things like that. And uh, build, you know, you, you have to be able to build your own framework. As long as you can explain how you did it and it's not totally outrageous, um, it is very important that we are trusted too, as financial institutions, to be able to do that. Um, but it is a, it's a, it's not an easy relationship, but we have to see it as part of the same team. Derek, do you want to come in there? Uh, I just was going to say, actually, it's an interesting point. You know, my experience of this was in the context of HSBC being about halfway through a five-year monitorship. By definition, there was no regulatory trust. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, it, the, the, the entire context was one in which there was such a, a degree of concern. Uh, that they felt the need to um, uh, have an, an in-house monitor and, and hold the, um, the potential for, for criminal sanction against the organisation. And so in that context, the kind of the regulatory relationship was, was um, very, very challenging. I think we, I mean, we have to remember that the regulators themselves are under pressure from political authorities above, above them. And what one of the things that we discussed in, in a pre-call to this, this webinar was you know, the regulators were perhaps seen as seen by the political forces as failing. You know, money laundering is continuing. There are some well-publicized failures that you'll know about. Um, and so the regulators themselves are under pressure. So I wonder, I mean, we're almost out of time, but I wonder to what extent part of what one does as a good MLRO is to help the regulators do their job. Yeah, I think it is to a certain degree. Um, I mean, we've done some work recently or, on um, uh, client, uh, also on asset screening, and, and you know, take the, the 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 lovely cannabis stock issue we all have, right? If where does it fit in? And and the, the guidance is very poor. We don't really know what you know. It's not really a crime, but it falls under pocket. And what do you do? So you build your own. Um, you know, framework around it. And then you have to be bold enough to, to, to try and, yeah, mm-hmm. lift that up and, and, and help uh, the industry, I, basically. I, I would sort of almost say that and, and more. So so as an MLRO, uh, or, or indeed sort of a, a, any kind of um, strategic financial crime professional, uh, don't just engage the regulator, but try and engage other parts of uh, the national authority or authorities. Um, so, so for instance, go and speak to Treasury in the UK, you know, and engage at that level. There are ways of sort of, um, to your point, Andrew, you know, regulators are subordinate to uh, government departments and accountable to government departments in nearly all jurisdictions. So engaging with those departments, engaging with leg- legislators as well, um, can be a useful sort of addition, I think, to an MLRO's uh, sort of armory on, on managing relationships. We're, we're out of time. Any part, so 30 seconds or one sentence for each of you, any sort of parting, just last remarks to, we've got you know 150 people from all over the world on this call. So one phrase, one sentence uh, as a parting shot. Let me start with, with I'll go uh, in order of Derek, Viri and, and Katerina. Derek? Um, I, I, 
perhaps let me reiterate that point that um, uh, I think from a relationship perspective and managing relationships with regulators, I think it's probably increasingly important not to view that as the only relationship you need to manage on financial crime. Um, and that, that there are other, if you like, external stakeholders, political, legislative stakeholders to engage as well. Very. I think um, with financial crime and uh, things like whistleblowing, it's quite a difficult and brave thing to do. So I think rather than speaking out, why don't we change the culture to speaking about money laundering and financial crime? within the organizations. What this does, it normalizes the discussions about financial crime and high risk uh, money laundering situations within the firm that allows people more awareness to be engaged in that, that will make it easier to then speak out when you need to. And Katerina. I would just say, make the difference you can, you know, with the role you have, because we all have relatively small roles in it all. Um, and you just do whatever you can in your part of the world to try and make it a better place. Thank you, all of you. Uh, thank you for our, to our three speakers. Thank you for all of you on the call. We'll be posting a recording of this on the website of uh, LIBF. And you can see in the chat that uh, Liam has posted that link um, where you'll be able to see the recording. And we're also going to record a short podcast where we'll discuss one or two things that we were not able to discuss in this hour. And that also will be posted on the LIBF, LIBF website. Thank you for your presence today. Good luck with everything you're doing. And goodbye. <laughs>